So I'm going to uh, talk about uh, a novel type of device. And to put it in the sort of context, some of our speakers have a very deep and broad understanding of the whole future of uh, nanotechnology. What we're looking at now is the mesoscale, that is hundreds of electrons. Uh, we're not yet really within sight of the molecular scale, one electron. Now at the mesoscale, rather than look at biology as the model, the philosophy I'm going to take is to look at materials. In other words, I'm looking at taking very simple structures and strange materials and letting the materials do the work. So here is our project. Uh, it's currently funded by DARPA. There are two universities, uh, Wisconsin and Penn State. So I'm not going to talk about the motivation for low power. We all know by now that we want low power. So here is a simulation done by Paul Solomon in our group. And we're comparing here the power vertically, switching energy for the fin fat uh, with uh, the piezo device that I'm going to talk about. And at 11 nanometers, we claim that we can achieve a factor of uh, 50 in reduced power. So what is this device referred to by one speaker as the fourth horseman of the apocalypse? Um, so how does it work? So when you apply a voltage, input voltage to the device, you apply it across a piezoelectric actuator which acts like a dielectric, so it looks uh, qualitatively just like a gate in CMOS. Now this piezoelectric actuator then expands and applies pressure to this uh, piezoresistor. Now the piezoresistor is a special material which uh, under pressure undergoes uh, insulated to metal transition. So at that point, uh, it uh, starts to conduct, turning on the current between this uh, output channel sensed to common. Uh, this is a picture of the log conductivity versus pressure of such a device, samarium, such a material, uh, samarium selenide. This is part of some very fine uh, Bell Labs work in the 70s. And you see that it uh, can change by seven orders of magnitude uh, with about three and a half uh, gigapascal of pressure. And we will be using part of that range, about uh, four orders, in the device. Now, uh, this device is not just electrical in nature, it is also uh, mechanical in nature. So how does the mechanical aspect of it work? So first of all, you have to surround this device uh, uh, two-component device by a rigid uh, 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 structure uh, consisting of a high-strength medium such as silicon nitride. Um, otherwise, it will just expand and not compress. Um, also, so here is a mechanical simulation using ANSYS. You see the high pressure achieved in the uh, piezo resistor. And uh, this is helped by the fact that uh, the area of the piezoresistor is small compared to the area of the piezoelectric, and this enables, on the one hand, to achieve a high pressure in the piezoresistor, and on the other, um, to achieve a relatively low pressure in the piezoelectric, which makes it happy. So all the materials are happy. Um, and finally, we use an empty space here uh, in order not to... Uh, constrict the motion of the materials. So now we've obviously done quite a bit of work on this, and what emerges is uh, that in fact this technology we call piezotronics has a unique set of advantages. Um, it's a complete technology. You can duplicate CMOS logic, and you also can uh, introduce a memory. 
Uh, it's low power. Uh, it should be able to operate at 0.1 to 0.15 volts at scale with maybe one fiftieth of the power of CMOS. Uh, it is fast, uh, equal to or faster than CMOS in practice. Uh, it is low noise. It is scalable. It follows the Denard scaling law, which has ceased to operate in CMOS because of the Boltzmann equation, as you've heard many times. Uh, and a high fan out is possible, uh, depending on numbers, possibly leading to the kind of high fan out logic uh, that we hear about uh, hypothetically. Uh, so what about the uh, capability for logic and the theoretical performance? So first of all, if we're going to build a CMOS-like uh, structure, we have to be able to build uh, devices that turn on with positive voltage and devices that turn on with negative voltage. Um, so one way of achieving that is to simply reverse the polling of the piezoelectric. Uh, so if you can imagine some devices polled uh, this way and some devices polled that way, these devices will be like the uh, P and N FETs familiar to us. And there is another way of doing it um, using a four-terminal device. Um, so this is some of the devices, uh, some of the logic you can create with this device. Um, this is a very simple uh, two-device flip-flop, uh, which you can build. And if you add two more devices, you have a four-device SRAM. Uh, this is the inverter, exactly the same as in CMOS. This is the NAND gate. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, for optimal uh, operation, you should use a four-terminal device in there. Uh, so simulation, the process we've gone through is we have started off with the uh, high dimensional device and we have then uh, extracted from that uh, an effective one dimensional model which we then uh, solve, uh, solve the differential equations using standard methods. So essentially the equations are that in the piezoelectric, you need to use these piezoelectric equations, um, and in the uh, piezoresistor, you just use these standard mechanical equations. And so two of these mechanical equations, where T is uh, stress, uh, V is the displacement, to these equations in the piezoelectric, you have to, of course, add charge density is equal to uh, dielectric constant times field, but then you have to add this piezoelectric term. And similarly to the stress-strain relation, you have to add uh, the piezoelectric uh, contribution driven by electric field, which will modify the strain. So uh, you essentially have to just solve these equations. And there's a coupling constant we, you can introduce, um, which for the materials that we desire to use, is of order 10. And what this means is the materials are so strongly electromechanically coupled that the purely mechanical coupling is almost irrelevant. So if you uh, set up the model and uh, describe a uh, inverter, so you see here input voltage, uh, output voltage, uh, there's the displacement uh, of the piezoelectric, uh, the first thing that you notice is it's under damped. Uh, where this type of system differs from CMOS is uh, the piezoelectric is under damped and the damping comes from the electrical resistance in the circuit. The, um, the piezoelectric gate, of course, charges from the uh, driving device in uh, RC time constant time. Uh, when the RC time constant time is uh, short, then the characteristic uh, time of the device is the sound propagation time through the piezoelectric, 
which is a few picoseconds. Uh, the energy uh, required to switch is a few attajoule at scale. Uh, so this is the ring oscillator, which is uh, what we use to set the scale. And so here is a description of the scale. Um, so this is the device which we might imagine uh, what we call ultimate scale. Uh, the piezoelectric is 30 nanometers tall, 20 nanometers wide, and the piezoresistor is uh, 3 nanometers tall and 4 nanometers wide. Now, th uh, th these are some earlier simulations with a dashed line. Uh, we've included sort of more... Uh, more uh, more kinds of effects, uh, getting this uh, full line here. And uh, so what you see is there's a, there's a transition. So what I'm talking about here is switching time versus voltage. Now, if the voltage is too low, what happens is you cannot sufficiently compress uh, the piezoresistor because the actuator is not driving hard enough. So under these circumstances... Uh, the resistance of the piezo resistor is high. That's the device output resistance. Therefore, RC time dominates, and you have a, a um, as the voltage drops further, you have a, a very rapidly increasing switching time. This is somewhat similar to the subthreshold region in CMOS. Uh, this region here um, is where the uh, the voltage is sufficient to compress the piezoresistor, and then the device has a few picosecond uh, switching time controlled by the sound uh, transmission time through the piezoelectric. Um, so how, how can that be so short, so brief? Because the, pie because the device is small. 4,000 meters per second, you can do it in your head. So now the materials, these are key. Um, so the piezo resistor, here is the uh, log R versus pressure uh, plot. Here are two conceivable operating points, at least for early experiments. Um, so to get adequate on-off ratio, you need high pressure. Uh, and this will be much aided by a high slope here. So this is a bit like the sort of subthreshold slope uh, in CMOS. You want this to be steep. Uh, and that's a materials thing. This is the simplest formula for the pressure in the piezoresistor. What does it depend on? It depends on, first of all, the D33 of the piezoelectric. The D33 is the expansion uh, in distance per volt that the piezoelectric will give you, piezoelectric sensitivity. It depends, obviously, on VG, the gate voltage, so obviously the higher the D33 PE, the smaller the needed gate voltage. Uh, and then the other obvious thing, these are mechanical properties. This is the area ratio. And you see it depends on scale. So the smaller the scale, uh, then the uh, lower the voltage. So it has the typical scaling uh, we see in Denard scaling. Uh, so to achieve low voltage, we need the high PE sensitivity, D33, and we need the materials to be operable at small scale. And that last one is kind of the key challenge which this technology poses. And here is an example of the piezoelectric uh, invented in Penn State about 23 years ago. This is the extension, uh, piezoelectric extension versus electric field. And these are the older materials down here. Uh, so now for the piezo resistor, which I'll talk about for a little bit, um, what are the key profit, what are the choices? Uh, well, there are two choices we've looked at. One of these are rare earth uh, calcogenoid materials, which were investigated at Bell Labs. And uh, the other choice are these sort of mod transition materials, uh, which also can show a high uh, pressure sensitivity. We haven't uh, really got any results on those. Uh, vanadium oxide is a possible choice, but VO2, unfortunately, has an unfortunate uh, transition temperature right in the operating range. So, so what, uh, what is it that makes this PR work? How does it work? Uh, 
So the characteristic of this uh, material, samarium selenide, is it has a conduction band which is 5D and which is empty and is fairly light at the bottom. Just what you need for a conduction band. Uh, below that are a densely packed series of 4F levels which act like a closed shell. And when you apply pressure, you move these uh, core levels, pseudo-core levels, up close to the D-band, and they can then ionize into the D-band or even join the D-band, and uh, this creates conduction in the D-band. So it's a pressure-driven dopant level rather than an electrically driven dopant, as in the CMOS. And this shows uh, calculations of the uh, gap narrowing versus pressure, which are pretty consistent with the data. So experimentally, we have uh, sputtered some of these samarium selenide films, typically 50 nanometers thick, down to uh, 8. And the hot sputtering gave much better X-ray uh, results. The films are polycrystalline. Um, we use graded composition to select uh, ideal samples. And we can achieve ohmic behavior, uh, and this is what we want. So the output resistance is ohmic in this device. So here is an example of a test structure where we put um, the magenta piezoresistor layer on top of a insulating silicon nitride layer with a, a via in it, half micron wide typically, and this constrains the current flow through the via. We apply pressure with a microindenter, and the radius of the contact, called Hertzian contact, uh, is wider than the via, so we know the pressure. So this test structure enables us to obtain experimental uh, resistance versus pressure plots. This is pressure. Um, and we achieve uh, three orders of magnitude change uh, in pressure, in a resistance, um, in these sputtered films. So how does the piezoelectric work? We must use this high quality uh, Penn State uh, piezoelectric. How does it work? Um, well, the phase diagram consists of a rhombohedral and a tetragonal uh, two regions with uh, a composition switch here called the morphotropic phase boundary, MPB here, between rhombohedral and tetragonal. And what happens in these materials is um, the polarization in the orthorhombic is to the cube corner. When you apply an electric field, it rotates the polarization. And so you get a large uh, response in polarization to the electric field because it's rotating. And now the crystal, uh, long axis, follows the polarization. So as I rotate the polarization, I also rotate the long ax axis of the crystal, uh, resulting in a piezoelectric effect, which is biggest along the 001 uh, direction. Uh, if, on the other hand, I go to the tetragonal region, the polarization is already pointing along 001. It's very uh, robust to extension. So the piezoelectric effect is very small along 001. So the place to work is here, where the crystal doesn't know exactly whether it's tetragonal or orthorhombic, and it's very easy to rotate the polarization. And that is the uh, place where we work. And that's uh, the discovery of uh, Penn State here. Um, so here are some uh, data. Uh, we're uh, working with uh, another Penn State group, Susan Trollier McCrinstry, uh, using uh, chemical solution deposition to create large area films. And uh, here's a, a side view. You see the extremely textured structures. Um, Stop already. Didn't give me five minutes. It's not nice. Um, 
So those are the uh, large uh, films which we're creating, large area. Um, uh, so, so here's a comparison between the films we're using at the moment with a D33 of 170. This is the uh, epitaxial, and these are the single crystal. So you see we've got a long way to go from where we are now to where we'd like to be at 2,800. So the device we're currently building, the Generation 1 device, is a sort of hybrid. We build the actuating pillars on silicon. We build the PR pillars on sapphire. Uh, flip the sapphire plate, place it on top, compress it with an indenter, and uh, apply a gate voltage, and you get a response. That's what it looks like. Um, this is the next generation device, which will be a fully uh, integrated device. That's quite a challenge for the integrators. And here is a list of the possible impediments, which I'll just leave you to read. Thank you. Stability is going to be? Well, we know uh, the, the piezo resistor, I don't think there'll be any problem. It melts at uh, 2000. Um, there'll be some temperature defend dependence, but it'd be rather moderate. Now, the piezoelectric uh, depend, it depends a lot on exactly what you're using, exactly what composition and phase. However, we can find some materials which will even go to 400. Uh, can be used in a back end of the line process. Others will be operable up to about 170 C. So, uh, well, you can it can go down to about 60 C. So you know for, we probably will be operating at you know 70 or 80 C. So I don't think there's a problem. Next. What if uh, you replace the samarium selenide with a nanomechanical uh, switch? Wouldn't it operate just about the same way? And what would be the trade-offs? The trade-offs are, well, yes to the first part. The trade-offs are the nanomechanical switch. Um, first of all, it, it is believed to have, you know, as far as current knowledge is concerned, a rather limited number of cycles. Nowhere near the 10 to the 15 cycles we need for logic. And that's a conservative estimate, in my opinion. Um, then there is the question of, stick, of sticking, stiction. It's often hi hysteretic. Um, there are some uh, possible remediations for the second effect, which may even impact the first effect. So I think it's too early to write off the nanomechanical switch, really. Uh, Samarian selenide, the temperature, you know, is a is a thermally activated uh, conduction, right? Yeah, yeah. So when you when you change the temperature, you are going to also change the resistivity. Yes. So that dependence uh, is much more stable than your pressure uh, pressurized dependence. Well, I mean, you you may get during operation, you may get a temperature rise of 50 C, something like that. Uh, then that's added to 300 C. Uh, you know, it's, it, the temperature is measured from absolute zero. So, you, so you'll get a, a shift of the operating point towards uh, lower resistance. So when you design the device, the engineering will allow for that shift in operating point. You know, it's similar with silicon. I'm sure the people are aware of the, of the, of the temperature of operation of the silicon, and they design the resistance appropriately. Okay. Let, let, uh, we have time probably for one quick question, and I think Eli wants it. <laughs> So my, my quick question is, uh, the, you told us the mechanism for changing the uh, resistivity, the conductivity of the samarium selenide. It involved electrons jumping from a D band uh, up to uh, a conduction band. Um, now, isn't there some finite time or speed with which the carriers uh, will jump up? Well, we think this is an electronic uh, transfer process and will take maybe 100 femtoseconds. Well, I mean, there's, uh, yeah, you've got a Boltzmann factor there. But when you're going, let me let me flip to, uh, 
Can you just sign it? Yeah. Oh. Oh, sorry about that. Just tell us. She's doing it now. Okay. We don't have to go very far. Okay, when we go to that, which is the... Uh, uh-oh. So, so here, down here is the metal, metallized region. Now, what you'd really like to do is to, is to have the on device in that metallized region. Now, in that region, the uh, F band is actually touching the bottom of the D band. So you don't have any thermal activation there. So that's really the answer to your question. What is the bang gap of this material normally? About uh, 0.3 EV. 